Hello, my name is Erica Carlson. I'm a theoretical physicist at the Purdue Quantum Science and Engineering Institute. In this series, I'm going to tell you some little snippets of the quantum world, and uh, hopefully that'll get you a little bit of introduction into the beauty of the quantum world and why we're so excited about it here at the Purdue Quantum Science and Engineering Institute. In the quantum world, you can do some very strange things. Maybe you saw the movie Ant-Man and you saw the very interesting uh, fanciful animations they have of what it might look like down there at the quantum level. If we could bring that quantum realm to our world into our everyday experience, we should see some very interesting things. For example, you wouldn't have to choose whether to be here or there. You could be both places at once. You wouldn't have to uh, decide which event to schedule on your calendar. Maybe you like me, you'd like to be all three or four places at once. You could do that in the quantum world. Uh, in the quantum world, you could also speed without getting a ticket. Uh, that may or may not be good, depending on how you feel about the morality of that. You could also walk through walls, uh, but only sometimes, okay? Most of the time, you'd probably just hit your head and bounce off, but every once in a while, it would work, and you would be able to walk through walls. If you're like me, and Google knows that you like quantum mechanics, then you might get some ads that tell you that you could use quantum mechanics to create your own reality. We'll deal with that in a future episode. Some of the strangeness of quantum mechanics comes from particle wave duality. Maybe you've heard of that. This is the idea that quantum mechanical particles are a particle and a wave, or maybe they're neither or both. We don't really have good uh, spoken language to describe what's going on there, but let's just say that sometimes these things act like tiny particles, which you can think of as a tiny ball, and sometimes they act like waves. And that can be a little bit strange to try to put into the same object. I mean, you know how balls behave. They bounce around and knock off of things. You know how waves behave. They're extended objects and they can flow and slosh and things like that. But to put them in the same object can be a little bit tricky. Let me give you a way to get started thinking about how that could happen. So a quantum mechanical wave might look something like this. It's flatlined in a lot of places. So it's flatlined here and it's flatlined over here but I've got this wiggly part in the middle. So the first thing to know about quantum mechanical waves is that the shape of the wave tells us everything we might want to know about the state of the particle. The state of the particle is just whatever it's doing. This could be where are you most likely to find the particle when you go to look for it. This could be what's its energy, what's its velocity. So for example, the particle is somewhere in the wiggly part, all right? And the places where this wave is wiggling more, you're more likely to find the particle when you go to look for it. You're never gonna find it out on one of these flat places over here or over here. If that, um, at the height of that wave goes to zero, you have zero chance of finding the particle there. So that's the first thing to know about these waves. They tell us things about what the particle is doing. Now, a way to get started thinking about particle wave duality is to keep in mind that most of the time we're talking about quantum mechanical objects that are actually very tiny. So think atoms or smaller. So uh, inside of an atom, there's the nucleus. The nucleus has neutrons and protons inside of it. And swarming around the nucleus are a bunch of electrons, depending on which, which atom you have. You may have one or more electrons in there. And the extent that those electrons take up is actually very tiny. It's about an angstrom. How big is an angstrom? Well, start with about a meter stick and divide that by 10 then divide that by 10, then divide that by 10. Do that 10 times and you have what's called an angstrom. That's about the size of an atom. So since the shape of this wave tells me where I'm likely to find a particle when I go to look at, when I go to look at it, if I'm thinking of this as something like the wave shape that an electron might take around an atomic nucleus, it's actually got to be very tiny. So think about shrinking this down so that the wiggly parts are only about an atom wide, about an angstrom wide, all right? And of course that's smaller than I can animate for you, but that means the particle's somewhere in that wiggly bit. We don't have to have the wiggles happening in a lot of places in space. In fact, for this wave, it's um, very, very small, so small as to be effectively zero throughout most of the universe. So that's one way you can get started thinking about particle wave duality. Next time, we'll talk about how it is that wave shapes like this can lead to 
the quantum. Okay, quantum uh, is about quantized behavior, meaning you can count it in whole numbers like one, two, three. It's discrete. So we'll talk about how you can get discrete numbers out of things that are waves and look like they should be able to take any shape at all. I'll see you then.